Thousands of demonstrators on Saturday took to the streets in several French-speaking African cities, calling the Pan-African Emergency Movement to say no to the franc CEFA, a currency they claim prevents development and is keeping countries in poverty. Members of civil society in Dakar, Senegal, Cotonou in Benin, Douala, Cameroon, Lebreville, Gabon, and Bamako in Mali have called for the abolition of the franc CFA that is shared by 14 francophone African countries. These protests follow the burning of a 5,000 franc CFA note by Senegalese activist Kemi Seba. We're asking to get out of the neo-colonial franc procession. It is important because ultimately for me, the name doesn't matter. For me, it doesn't matter if we have a currency called CFA. The thing is this currency, whatever its denomination, the FCFA should be a sovereign currency or a currency whose monetary policy is defined by and for Africans. Hello everyone, this is African Esquire and this is a video by the Federation of African Liberation. If you want to learn more about our organization, we are a pan-Africanist organization that seeks to unite Africans throughout the diaspora for the purpose of mutual liberation of all African people. So if you want to learn more about our organization, there is some information in the description box. So what I want to talk about today is, is really something that's always been on my heart ever since I learned about this issue. You. And I've talked about it on my channel before and I'm talking about it again because I noticed that it's just continuing and continuing and continuing and our people are not waking up or doing anything about it. At the same time, we see that other people, they, they would know better. They would do something. They would be more active. They would be more militant if something like this were to happen, happening to their people. So um, before I even get into the, the subject that I really want to talk about, I want to talk about what's going on in France right now. So if you don't know, there's a big protest going on in France and it's called the Yellow Jacket protest. And basically if you um you know pay attention to the news, um every once in a while they'll talk about it. It's not as heavily talked about as other things and at least in, in American TV, I haven't I don't know what country you're in. But um people are some people are a little nervous because this yellow jacket protest is kind of reminiscent of the Occupy movement, which was a movement uh, mostly led by white liberals who sought to undo the corruption from capitalism and the enrichment of the people on the top at the expense of the people on the bottom. So I want to read a little bit about this protest. And and reason why I want to talk about this is that I want to talk about the fact that we have to understand how people identify what their interests are. And when they identify their interests, they can unite for their interests until that issue is eradicated. So the... Um, this, there's okay so just to give you a little brief summation of what the protest is about so it all started from an online petition right um, and the petition got 300,000 signatures and mass demonstrations all over France uh, the movement in France is motivated by fueling prices and the high cost of living in France and claims that a disproportionate burden of the government's tax reforms were falling on the working and middle class. Now, um, this is a quote from an NBC article. The article is entitled, Who are France's Yellow Jacket Protesters and What Do They Want? Now, this um, person named Famke Kronmuller, who is an expert in French political politics at OpenSit's political consultory firm, um, described basically what her understanding of what the protests are. And I thought it was very interesting. She said, uh, it's the white middle class, the forgotten middle class in France. She also says they're fed up with the rising prices at the cost of and the, and the cost of living. She explained that they feel like the political elite is forgetting about them. Um, and, you know, this movement movement has grown quite a bit. It's not only in France, it's actually spread to other countries. So I'm just going to read some of the countries that are now basically pushing this yellow jacket movement. And um, so we have Belgium, Bulgaria, we have Canada, Croatia, Egypt, Germany, Iraq, Ireland, Israel, Italy, Jordan, Netherlands, Pakistan, Poland, Portugal, Russia, Serbia, Taiwan and Tunisia. So what's interesting about a lot of these countries is that a lot of them are similarly situated 
as France. Um, a lot of them are also capitalistic countries. A lot of them are countries that are predominantly white. And a lot of them are people who are trying to get the elite of their countries to actually service them. So the reason I wanted to talk about this before I let into my topic is because I want us to honestly understand how other people work, how other people um how, how they identify their interests. Not because we shouldn't know this, we should know this. However, we have to know that we have been colonized, we've been enslaved to where we don't naturally understand the the, the uh, usefulness of uniting. We don't naturally understand that we can go on doing our own individual things, doing for ourselves, but that really won't benefit us in the end. Uh, we've been programmed to think that as individuals, we are more productive than as a collective, as a community. But the people in France and the people who have also adopted this movement, they understand that collectively you can get things done. You can't get things done on your own. This is not just in the Yellow Jacket movement. This is also on Wall Street. This is with all the prominent families in the world who own uh, different industries. All of them, if you you know follow them and actually watch with how they uh, act with one another, they all come together. Even if they're, they seem like they're in different industries, they seem like they don't have anything to do with each other. These people often meet with each other because they have common interests. Common interest is the motivating force behind a lot of what these people get together for. And they recognize that even though maybe you're in France and I'm in the U.S., maybe you're in Belgium and the other person is in Mexico, it doesn't matter because if we're all going after the same thing, and for the people on top, it typically is the exploitation of peoples, the exploitation of other countries, whether it be on the African continent, Latin American continent, the exploitation of the poor for the benefit of the rich. Once you understand your common interest, that will motivate you to get together with people who you might have nothing to do with. And think about how that corresponds to the black community because if you if you pay attention to a lot of how we act with one another, once we find out that there are differences among us, some of us, for example, we might be Christians and we only want to deal with Christians, we might be Muslims, we only want to deal with Muslims, uh, we might be uh, anti, we might be African spiritualists and only want to interact with African spiritualists. And so if you try to get these people into one room, to focus and talk about something, to actually push an agenda that affects all of us, a lot of them can't help themselves but to insult the other, to say, because you don't believe what I believe, that means that you must not be as clear-headed as me. You must not be as smart as me. You must not know what I know. And instead of focusing on the, the issue that's hurting all of these people together, you end up splintering off. You end up name-calling. You end up in your segregated groups thinking that as individuals, you will be more effective than if you're joining with those backwards people because, you know, they don't believe everything you believe. This is a mentality that has been ingrained into us from slavery, from colonialism. If you study slavery and study, study colonialism, that was one of the main tactics that was used on a plantation, used to actually, on, on when, it, when it comes to colonialism, that was one of the main tactics that was used to actually conquer peoples, was to give one people the idea that they're different and that the other people are backwards. And that, that way, they will not understand that they actually have more in common. Even if this white man's gonna give you a little bit of land, that the fact is you should have way more. Your people should have way more. Your people should not be living as second class citizens. But because you think you're different, because you've been programmed in your mind to think that you are distinguished, for that reason, you will act against your own people and against your own interests. So I say this again because we have so much going on in the diaspora right now. If I were to just talk about you know, Africans in America, Blacks in America, and not even talk about what's going on as far as Blacks in the whole diaspora. If I were to just focus on us, it would be difficult enough to actually break down how much we are divided. Because I see so many of my people, we don't want to talk with people because they're Hebrew Israelites. We don't want to talk with people because they're Nation of Islam. We don't want to talk with people because they're Christians. We don't want to talk with people because they're too radical. They're too this, too that. You don't want to talk to someone because they identify as a Republican. You don't want to talk to someone because they voted for Hillary Clinton. You don't want to talk to someone for so many reasons. And the, the thing is, you know, you don't never have to agree with everything that someone says. You never have to agree with everything that someone does. But you have to understand that regardless of what they believe, 
regardless of what type of religious beliefs that they practice, or regardless of the political affiliations that they have. We're all affected by this crazy thing called capitalistic white supremacy. We're all affected all in common. We're all affected by imperialism. We're all affected by colonialism. So that's just in America. But if we actually get outside of America, then you have our brothers and sisters in the Caribbean who are facing very similar things as people in Americas and in Africa, but we're so splintered. We're so unable to work together. And because of that, nothing gets accomplished. Mm -hmm. And until we realize that because we are so um, splintered off, because we are so so uh, separated, so individualistic and in how we think we can solve our problems, that that actually might be the reason why we have not fixed our problems. Look at all the other people in the world and actually study how they react, how they behave with one another, and you'll realize that there's a real reason, a scientific reason, why our people are the the worst off in the world. It's not just that we're the most attacked, that's certainly true, but of all the people, we're the most people, we're, we're least able to put our differences aside and actually fight for one another. And some of us aren't even willing to fight for ourselves because they, they've lost the fight. They've completely said, okay, I'm done. I'm just gonna get what I can get and I'm gonna be happy with what I have. And that's a lot of people also. So we have to understand there are actual reasons why we're in the shape that we're in. So um, I'm saying this to say, I really want to talk to the diaspora with this issue. I'm going to talk about the issue again of um, of the colonial tax, or in other words, the CFA francs that are inside of many uh, West African and Central African countries. I believe the total is 14 countries that the French government has control over these countries' uh, economies. I'm appealing to the diaspora right now. The diaspora, meaning if you're of any African descent, whether you are actually on a continent, whether you have actually been moved off the continent on your free will, whether you've been taken from the continent against your will, uh, regardless of where you are, um, we have to understand that these issues affect all of us in common. That as long as people who look like us, who come from our people, can be treated inside of the humiliating way that we are treated in different places in the world, it might not be in your country, it might be somewhere far away, but understand that affects you. Because when you go inside of different places, when you walk inside of your own neighborhood, you are a member of that class of people who are designated for ill treatment. You are not, you are a member of that class of people who are designated for lack, for no respect. So that follows you. Even if you don't think it follows you, it absolutely does. It, I remember long Long time ago, I was noticing this is before Black Lives Matter, the Black Lives Matter movement happened. I remember I was watching the news and I would just notice how um, I think it was, I don't know if it's in Kenya, there was a mass uh, murder. I believe it was in a mall and like over 200 people or something like killed. And I just remember how casual it was to the world. And then shortly after that, you know, we have. Um, something like 15 or something people killed in Paris. And, you know, human life is human life, right? So we should feel, you know, sad, you know, when anyone dies. But if 200 people die here and 15 people die here, um, you know, and but the 15 people moves the international community and the 200 people does nothing for the international community. What is that saying about your life? <laughs> that is saying that you are not meant to be uh, to be valued. You are not of value. When the international community, including people who look like us, value other lives more than our more than our own. And it's not to say that there's a difference between human life, whether or not you're African or or European or whatever but the fact is when you see how they they move you see how policies change you know there is a completely difference in policy because of that uh, journalist that um, was murdered in Saudi Arabia but you'll never see that as far as the many journalists who have been expelled, journalists that have been expelled from Togo, for example, so many African countries where if you speak out, you have, you may be killed, you might disappear. They're, those those people, they're, they're, they're fine to be gone because they're not going to move international policy because they're not valued. And understand, it's the value that we put on ourselves enough to say that even if you're not going to speak out for us, 
we're going to speak out for ourselves. We're going to fight for ourselves. And if we're not willing to change that, then we're not willing to actually see a day when African people, wherever they are in the world, are actually treated the same or equal with other people. Because it first starts with us. If we can't recognize it, if we can't enforce it, then it's not going to happen. It's not going to be recognized. Because if we can't do it, guess what? They're sure as heck not going to value you. They're probably not going to value you regardless of not <laughs> whether or not we do value ourselves. But we certainly should value ourselves so that we can push our own policy and our own interests. So with that said, to the diaspora, um, I really want us to think about what this issue means. What does it mean that this is happening in 2018 and it's about to be 2019? What does it mean that this has continued to happen in spite of the fact that human rights has supposedly been the new change inside of policy, international policy? What does it mean that this is still happening with France that is a country that is supposed to be like so progressive, but in fact is actually still as much of a colonist as it was a hundred years ago? What is it? What does it mean? And really think about that. What does it mean that we still live in our world? Does that mean that we can um, live in this world and not be affected? Or does this mean that we're absolutely affected and that this says something about the way that all of us are viewed and regarded inside of this earth? So, all right, so let's get into this. Um, some of you don't know, the country of France is very dependent on Africa. And it's so funny to see this yellow jacket issue coming up because what you see a lot of times is people, they can only see their own issue. They can only see their own struggle. So, for example, with them, oh, my gosh, the, the gas prices went up. Oh, that's horrible for us. Oh, my gosh, the taxes have gone up. Oh, my gosh, the, uh, the price of living has gone up. So our lives are horrible. We have to fight back, right? And they convince themselves that this is absolutely uh, an abomination to be living under these conditions, right? But they don't really recognize that outside of this, there's a whole plethora of things going on and that is being enforced by your government that has done far worse to people of the world. And one of those things has been the France um, exploitation of Africa. So um, if you don't know, like France com uh, colonized um quite a few African countries, and to this day, they still have policies inside of those countries that make make sure that they are the dominant presence inside of those countries, that they d decide things about their military, about their economy, um, about who's in power and who's not in power. And it's so, it's so, 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 um, blatant you know like if even so many times throughout history i'm gonna read some quotes from some french presidents um in 2008 march 2008 uh former french president jacques chirac said without africa france will slide down into the rank of a third world power and uh, his prede predecessor actually said in 1957 that without Africa, France will have no history in the 21st century. So let's just back up and think about that. Africa and, and the French francophone, um, I hate using that term because we shouldn't identify ourselves, you know, by co colonialism. But unfortunately, we have to distinguish ourselves somehow whenever we're talking about these issues. So for the purpose of this video, we'll say francophone speaking countries um, in Africa. Those countries, if you go to any of them, are so decimated from French colonialism and neocolonialism. And, you know, FAL, Federation of African Liberation, we really focused a lot on Togo. And we've had, we have a lot of videos where we bring Break down just how the people are suffering in Togo, but it's not just Togo. It's it's um the it's the Congo, um it's Guinea. All of these countries, their economies have been decimated by what the French have done. The French were very vicious in their form of colonialism because to them, you have to actually try. They want to manipulate the African to want to be French, and whenever, whenever they left these territories, um they were they were so upset that these people were rejecting France, that a lot of times, if, um, let's say there was a school or a hospital or something that the colonists built, they would burn it down on their way down just to send a message to the African people, although their their labor actually built these schools and hospitals, but they want to send a message to them that um, you don't reject France, you don't reject us. But if you can imagine the goal of these French presidents saying, you know, without Africa, um, France has no future. Without Africa, fr France will be lost from history. It's crazy because we know that these individual countries, uh, where we want to talk about Togo, Ivory Coast, uh, Senegal, 
All of them are insignificant as far as serving themselves. So how dare you, you know, feel like, well, you know, thank you, Africa, for serving us and you're well off and you're prosperous. And these countries, the people are suffering. The people don't have control of their resources. The people are being exploited and the people are very poor. And this is the, the colonist mentality. They feel okay with this setup. They feel okay saying that, oh, well, without Africa, uh, France won't have a will have a history because to them their interests prevail over the interests of African people because to them they're not significant enough but we have to know that we're significant we have to know that our people are just as significant as any other people and deserve respect in the same exact way so there's actually another quote um, former French minister Jacques Godfrey uh, he he also said uh, a little country with a small amount of strength we can move a planet because our relations with 15 or 20 African countries and yet none of those African countries can move the planet. Think about that. Think about that dynamic. France gets to be the superhero in the world. France gets to be this great almighty power because of 15 or 20 African countries. But not one of those countries gets to have any of that power. Not one of those countries gets to move any any type of planet. Not, 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 nothing. Those countries are reserved to be insignificant. They are basically um, this just for being used and they're not for actually having self-reliance. They're not for having independence and they're certainly not for exercising their own power. So think about that mentality, that this is the dynamic that's gone on. Every French president knows it. The current president, French, um, Macron, knows it very well. And that's why you always see them in France. I mean, in Africa, trying to make sure that they have solidified their allegiance from the African leaders. But the fact is, that regardless of um, what you know what happens, they're still going to realize that if without African Africa's power, that they have no power in themselves. So we're going to go to another article, um, and this one I think breaks down really well the CFA Frank issue. So this is an ex. I'm reading some excerpts as I always do, but the title of the article is on Atlanta Black Star. You can look it up. While the EU is buying. Is is busy fighting tax havens. France is bleeding African nations dry with the colonial CFA currency. This is about Amari Jackson. So I'm gonna read from this article. It's kind of you know a little long, but I think these are all things to be um, to know and just understand. So I'm gonna read through it. Um, the CFA franc, CFA being. African financial community and French com commune commune financier Francien is a French issued and controlled currency used in 14 African countries, 12 being former French colonies. Through it, this community is beholden to the monetary policies of the European Central Bank and its executive uh, mechanisms. The Central Bank of West African States and the Bank of Central African States. So there are two banks, the two banks basically that are used and to and to control these currencies. These central banks issue the currency and extend credit and hold external reserves as a result of a colonial era agreement where the community members deposit 65% of all foreign currency reserves in a shared reserve fund to France. So maybe you didn't catch that, so I'm gonna break it down. These countries that have the CFA franc, uh, let's say your uh, Senegal, let's say your Togo, 65% um, of your money has to be deposited inside of the French bank. For them to use as a reserve so you're an independent country you're you're a citizen you're, you grow up inside of um, your country you're, you you think that you're paying your taxes you think that you're doing things um, you know and your country should be serving you but 65% of their money is going into the bank of an outside country this is colonialism straight up and anyone who doesn't understand how crazy that is. I mean, imagine if America had to give 65% of their money to China to be on reserve. Uh, imagine if China had to give 65% of their money to um, Israel. Like, imagine how crazy those people would feel like, what? why are we doing this? And that's the big question. Why are they doing this? What are they getting for this? What are they getting for this? So let's keep reading. Um, 
By controlling the currency and credit of these member nations and generating billions in interest from their reserves, France benefits from an orchestrated economic dependency of large swaths of West and Central Africa while maintaining its own post-colonial piggy bank. Certainly, the spotlight needs to be put on France when one begins to discuss the problems that the African continent is compelled to endure, said prominent historian Gerald Horn, author of numerous books on the African continent. Rather than pointing the finger at neocolonialism and imperialism as the primary causes for Africans' underdevelopment, the African people themselves are blamed for their underdevelopment, said Horn, noting that this is not only a misrepresentation of reality, is it a, defa is it is a defaming of the African continent. And that's a very important quote. If you remember recently, the French president caught a lot of slack, um, Emmanuel Macron, because he did a speech where he blamed Africa's underdevelopment on the high fertility rates. He has nothing to say about French colonialism. He has nothing to say about the fact that they have these uh, the CFA franc in place. All he wanted to talk about was the fertility rate. This is what they do. This is the, the mind games that are played. It's not our fault that you're like this. It's your fault. It's your fault that you're underdeveloped. It has nothing to do with colonialism. It has nothing to do with neocolonialism. And that's why we have to make sure that we're talking about these, these two issues, neocolonialism and, and colonialism, because um, if we don't, then we'll get stuck in talking about the effects. So you have the cause and the effect. The cause is that you have a country, a foreign country, who is seeking to control the policies, seeking to control the resources, and seeking to control the money of your region. That's the cause. So there are lots of effects to that cause. Uh, Corruption is an effect to that cause. Um, puppet, puppet leaders are an effect to that cause. Um, people not being educated because they don't have the, the their own resources. That's an effect to that cause. So we can talk about these effects all day, but if we're not talking about the cause and we don't knock out the cause of our issues, then we're just going to keep re regenerating um, new issues, even if we got rid of those issues, even if we did educate all African children, even if uh, the fertility rates were lowered, even if the puppets were all taken out. As long as the cause to the issue is still in place, we're always going to be dealing with the effects of that issue. So, um, moving on, ironically, France has been honest about its own um, economic dependence on the former African colonies, and I actually read some of these quotes, so let me skip over that. Um, France is indebting and enslaving Africans by means of Africa's own wealth. Um, citing blah, blah, blah. So, France grants as credits to Africa at an interest rate of 5 to 6% or more. Uh, the tragedy of the square relationship where France takes African money and generates massive interest before loaning it back to the, to the African CFA nations to generate additional interest. So this is not something that they're going to be charitable. This is a ploy in order to gain not just um, control of the African economies, but actually get a benefit for themselves, a monetary benefit. Uh, the allegory of the bleeding Africa and feeding France is no exaggeration. The cost in terms of underdevelopment in human suffering is staggering. So um, in an interview in 1996, this is actually interesting, uh, Gavin's former president, Omar Bongo, said that we are in Frank zone. Our operations accounts are managed by the French National Bank in Paris, who profits from the interest of our money that our money generates, France. Um, however, Bongo had in a long line of CFA leaders personally benefited from this relationship and even if the even the citizens they ruled over did not um even though the citizens they ruled over did not in many cases by propping up African puppets with riches and lavish lifestyles, France could maintain political control over its former colonies. I really want to talk about that part right there because I often hear people or I'll see comments on my videos saying, well, the problem is the African leaders. The problem is the leaders. They're the problems. So, you know, if, if Africa could have better leaders, then this issue would not be what it is. And we have to understand. African leaders, we can't look at them as part of the population. We can't, not most of them, we can't look at them as um, as serving the public because they many times were put into place, put into power by the colon colonist governments. So if you're put into power by France, you, and France is the one who um, is paying you, France is the one who's sponsoring you, your whole existence, your whole reason for being a president of whatever country, a Gabon or whatever, 
is because of the French government, then understand that um, your allegiance should be to the France. Every once in a while you'll get an idiot I mean who just totally shocks the world, but most people, their allegiance would be to the person who's going to keep them in power and the person that um, put them in power. Most, most people. So... I'm not saying this is an excuse to the leaders. I'm saying this to the people that we have to understand these leaders are just as much a part of the colonist government as the actual colonists. They are a necessary component. Every single time we're in colonialism, there always had to be a middleman. There always had to be someone who actually ex exerted control over the people. But that person was just as much as part of the colonist regime as the colonists. So don't get fooled to think that, oh, are we go we'll go to our president. Oh, we'll, we'll change things by going to them and things will actually change. These people are just as much as part of the system as the, as the colonists who was giving them the orders. So I'm saying this to say, when we, as people, we, we, we hear these issues happening in Africa, we can't just say, well, that's your leader's fault. We have to understand that these leaders are not in a position to actually act. And therefore, the, the onus really falls on us. This is why I really started this, um, the, move, the video out talking about, you know, us in the diaspora. We have to understand that we are the people. We are the ones who have the most ability to change the situation. A lot of these leaders, frankly, even if they wanted to change the situation, and many of them don't because they're getting nice, lucrative deals, um, but even if they wanted to, there are things called assassination plots that happen. Look at the, the history of the U.S. government interference on the continent of Africa. You'll realize that many people have been assassinated. Thomas Sankara, Patrice Lumumba, these are just two of many people who have been assassinated for actually trying to change um, the course of what happens inside of the African continent. And it's not an excuse to the leaders. I still think that you should do what you're actually tasked with doing. I do think that you shouldn't sell out the interest of your people just for a paycheck. Um, that's the right thing to do, right? But at the same time, we have to understand that the people are the ones who will ultimately get to change what happens. Um, if the people were backing up uh, Patrice Lumumba and Thomas Sankara the way that they should have been, maybe the, it wouldn't have been so easy for that assassination to mean the end of a movement. You look at that as in many type of movements. You look at that, for example, in the Nation of Islam, um, not the Nation of Islam, with Malcolm X, whenever he was assassinated, what happened? A whole movement basically stopped as far as what he was doing was when he was trying to uh, unite Africans in America with Africans throughout the diaspora. His, his whole organization fell apart, basically. So we have to be understanding as pe the people, we have as much to say as uh, do our leaders, our figureheads, our speakers, people who actually speak for us, we have a lot to do with what happens. So if we can all take responsibility for what is happening and stop looking at the African leaders and saying that it's their fault, then we can actually change the way that things happen and change the way that uh, history uh, runs its course. So um, moving on, I want to read um, another just excerpt from an article because a lot of people I've heard say this, you know, uh, why do us, you know, us in America, we're so worried about what's going on in Africa or us over here, we're, why are they we more worried about it than they are? That's a real misconception. There's a lot of people who you don't hear about who actually are fighting, who actually are doing things and all because you don't hear about them and you're not uh, in the position to hear about them because maybe you're in another country. Um, that doesn't mean that they're not actually doing things. So I've seen this um, activist, his name is Kimmy Siba who actually was protesting the CFA Frank. And um, he was actually arrested for protesting the CFA Frank. So this is an article from BBC. It's called African Protest Over the CFA Colonial Currency. Kemi Siba was arrested last week following a complaint by the Central uh, Bank of West African States. Uh, the CFA um, is a colonial uh, currency that is used in several African countries, as we know. So he was among many activists calling for the CFA to be abandoned, saying it is a relic of French colonialism. On August 25th, 2017, police officers descended on his residence in Dakar with an arrest warrant for probably one of the most controversial black activists in the Francophone world. A week earlier, um, he had taken, basically he had taken a CFA franc um, for 5,000 CFA and burnt it. So um, the bank sought court action and he was arrested on the charge of destroying property, which would have landed him in jail for up to five years if he had been found guilty. Um, however, on a technicality, um, 
he was not found guilty because he only uh, destroyed a single banknote, and the the statute says you will be uh, punished for destroying banknotes, plural. So he got out on a technicality. So there were different people throughout the diaspora, um, throughout the African continent, who were trying to push back on this currency. So I'm asking for my people in the diaspora that we actually really do support these people, and we actually do support this movement. Maybe you know you want to join Kimi Siba. Maybe you want to burn a, a CFA frank. Um, and I, you know, I'm not telling me what to do that because frankly, I don't know what country you live in. I don't know what your rep repercussions are, but that's absolutely, you know, up to you. If you feel like you're led to do that. I know one thing I read that he was saying was to him was very symbolic of when Nelson Mandela, uh, burnt his passport, uh, that, that the, uh, South Africans told black South, South Africans that they, that they had to have on them. They had to always have their papers on them. So he burnt his passport. So to him, that was a, a sign of liberation and, um, perhaps you can, up with him. Um, I looked him up on Twitter, for example, and see, you know, if there's something that could be staged as far as a mass demonstration on a continent, um, as far as doing what he did. But as for us who are not there and don't have access to um, CFA Franks to burn, um, you know, we FAL, Federation of African Liberation, we did push, we were pushing and we're pushing a, a, a petition and we have a, 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 a link on change.org. We're asking that people throughout the diaspora that you actually who identify with the struggle that who who actually vehemently disagree with what France is doing and the fact that they've gotten away with this for so long um, that you take a stand and that you boycott French products. And the reason why we said boycott French products is because this is a form of economic warfare. Um, not just boycott, but actually, you know, we have a petition. But I would even say if you could post a video. Um, explaining why you're boycotting French products, explaining why uh, what France has done to Africa, what they have been just continued to do, the fact that they continued this policy up until 2019, going into 2000, um, I mean 2018, going into 2019. So let me read some of the products that we're um, boycotting. <coughs> Excuse me. So here's some products, for example, common French products, and we're asking, you know, if you are in a diaspora. If you see these at the store, just keep walking and, you know, be, actually show solidarity. Um, and we can actually have a great impact. So we have L'Oreal, Carol's Daughters. This is from my natural sisters. Um, Carol's Daughters is not black owned. It's actually owned by France. Essie, Lacombe, Giorgio Armani, Ralph Lauren, Urban Decay, L'Oreal Paris, Garnier, Maybelline, NYX Cosmetics, Soft Sheen, and Carson. That's another um, company that people think is actually black owned. It's not. Soft Sheen, Carson is actually owned by a France company, French company. Uh, Dark and Lovely, this is a, the relaxers that's actually owned by a French company. Uh, Gentle Treatment, Magic, so many of you might have Magic, uh, I believe they make grease or something. Um, Magic Shave, Ultra Sheen, Cartier, Chanel, Christian Dior, Yves Saint Laurent, uh, Louis Vuitton, Danon, like Danon Yogurts, and Yo Play. So these are just a few products. I'm not tasking everyone to actually go out and research every single product that you have, but these are well-known products that a lot of people get, and we're asking that people actually join us and actually um, really protesting what's going on over in France, um, going over in Africa, and that we actually see something happen. So, as I said, if you could sign a petition, there's a link down in the description to our change.org petition, but don't just sign a petition. Be vocal about this issue. Let's spread awareness because many of us aren't aware this is happening. Many of us aren't aware that France is um, economically crippling African countries like this. Many of us think this is a thing of the past, a thing of colonialism, and not a thing that's happening today. Um, but once we actually get the word out, spread information, the hope is that many of us will actually... Um, become united in this issue and actually push the issue to the forefront. Don't wait for CNN, BBC, um, Al Gazeera. Don't wait for any of these entities to push your interests, your issues to the forefront. Don't wait for anyone to actually push what's going on with you before you push it yourselves. And so we have the tools, we have social media. Many of our people never got to see this luxury. Many of our activists, many of the people who were revolutionaries never got to see social media and the effects of it. So we have a tool that we can actually get the word out to people all over the diaspora. So I'm really asking that people push 
this issue and that we actually see a change. And so I'm asking for the last time the Africans in the diaspora that we support an end, a finally an end to the CFA franc that has been used inside of West African countries. So that is all I have for this video. Um, as I said, information will be in the description box. I will see you all in another video.